So, Mariah, are you there? I am here, Simon. Where are you? I am sitting in my kitchen in Amsterdam, in the north of Amsterdam. It's a beautiful day and I cannot go outside. Yeah, I think I kind of know that feeling in the moment. Yeah, I even got today, this morning, a, a, an, an official emergency alert from the government telling us all, all us being all the Dutch people or people living in Holland, to really not go outside because if the sun is beautiful and shining and uh, and our nature reserves are so full that it is dangerous which is crazy yes kind anyways of, yeah 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 it's this it's the same here and um, we had uh, some very very serious addresses from our politicians that said please please do and it's like this and uh, <laughs> yeah so we're here i'm very excited we have been speaking we have been preparing for months obviously and um, the setup of the audio and everything is the highest standard and we've invested <laughs> millions of euros in our uh, studio and um, I kind of wonder how we got here so uh, <laughs> I'm sitting now I, I was thinking before when we when we talked about it about this idea uh, I, th I thought that we should meet no meet in person and now mm -hmm. we, are, we are sitting in front of the microphone and I, I thought that's a very 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 strange situation to to speak to each other but now after these months of preparing it's it it feels also very exciting i have to say very exciting and very 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 fun to do and i i kind of like it well that's a good thing yes. Simon. <laughs> and but my question how how did we get here yeah good point It's maybe a good time to, to put a little frame around this uh, this talk, actually. As we are now isolated, it's uh, it's March, just over mid-March yeah, in the spring. And, uh, and because of this virus, we have been all requested to stay indoors. No public gatherings, no... Uh, No performances, basically. No concerts. And this means for many uh, artists, uh, performer artists, that you are not only isolated in your house, but you also cannot work. And uh, I was extremely happy, uh, Simon, when, when this podcast idea came into my life through you, but even more now in this situation, because it is absolutely something to uh, make the most of this isolation to you know as you said we can't do the theater but we can talk about it yes. can't we yes so it's it's it started yes it started uh, three weeks ago when i told you it mm -hmm. was not months i joked it was not months it started <laughs> some two or three weeks ago when when i when i told you this idea of of starting a Uh, a podcast uh, talking about theater and um, out of different reasons but I never would have expected that this would be the real reason to 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 really urgently start it because yeah. uh, and I find it extremely strange we're really deprived of of the all the means of all that we do because no spectators no actors no colleagues no room to go into Mm -hmm. uh, together and uh, so we are kind of uh, um, put back inside of, of of our of our rooms alone and how to how to bridge how to bridge over this yeah. this 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 ocean of, of 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 emptiness if we can't make theater if we can't go to see performances we can or we have to at least speak about it no And uh, technology, which I was always very, I mean, for theater, I was always very skeptical because theater is, is a, a presence, is, is the art of, of something which is really present there. It's spectator and actor. Mm -hmm. Now there is no spectator and actor. And so technology is helping us to, to, to go on and to, yeah, to go on working somehow. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, what you are saying brings to my mind two points of the theater that I found very fascinating. One is what is left of theater when there is no performances. 
actually that's the big question like what what is what is left what can we what can we have of it and it it's actually the two things that that made me fall in love in a way with the theater because I was not liking theater at all for most of my life I was in love with music and to an extent with dancing and uh and theater for me uh, very very boring and uh, and not interesting at all. But then I met this uh, strange group of people called Odin Theatret at the Ista, and and in a flash I saw they they showed me that um, theater can be a way of thinking, a thinking theater firstly, and secondly. Theatre has a craft, and a craft you can engage with it uh, very intimately on your own. And this is what every musician, for instance, knows the craft of their instrument, me and my instrument, that is a bond that is very personal and very intimate. There's no other people need it. And, uh, and these, these two things, the thinking theatre and the craft of the theatre, I think what is... Uh, what is very present now for me in the absence of performance, those two things are more strong at the foreground. Hmm. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned ISTA, the International School of Theatre Anthropology, mm -hmm. which is interesting because we also met there. It was True. in 2006, 2016 in April yeah. in the beautiful village of Albino, near Bergamo, where now yeah. I think it's the most terrible lockdown yes. and situation. It's the epicenter no, of, the, of the crisis in Italy Yes, at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I remember meeting you and, uh, um, and now I am very surprised that it was, you said it was your first contact with the theater. It was the first uh, meaningful contact, uh -huh. let's say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what did you do before? Um, or what are you still that's doing? A, that's a very long, <laughs> long story. <laughs> that's a very long story. But it's probably good that we introduce ourselves, Simon. Yes. Ah, yeah. Who are, who are you? What's your name? Well, I, my name is Mariah Ni. I also have a Chinese name, which is Ni Mei Wan, but I never use it. So it's like a secret. Not anymore. Uh, you told I, your secret. I know that one should never do that. <laughs> I, I don't. According to we don't edit anything out. We talk, We said. Oh shit! Yes. <laughs> well, according to almost all the fairy tales in the world, now you have power over over my my uh, innermost secrets. Yeah, not only me, also everybody also, who's listening. Oh, damn! Yes. All right. Well, I surrender. <laughs> um, so. I try to keep it very short. I think uh, more information will come later. As a as a youngster, <laughs> when I was born, <laughs> as a youngster, I, I wanted to be a musician. That I have to say, looking back now, I'm 48. That has always been the big love of my life, music. But I cannot really play an instrument, which ah, is terrible. And then I thought, okay, so I will... Uh, I was. I, I tried piano, trumpet, accordion, uh, violin, everything, but um, no. And I chose to study law from the motivation of, uh, okay, so why are we doing as we do? What is the what is the sense behind our society? And uh, and I the the study was very interesting. You know that uh, Bertolt Brecht. He also studied law. And ah. yeah, he studied law because they told him, or he he thought, if you study law, you have a lot of time to do your poetry. So, <laughs> but I don't. Nice. I think there's it's different times now. That's so nice. Well, actually, you know, I I started tap dancing when I was a law student. I think it's true. I I trained my uh, my tap dancing through. Uh, while I was studying law and then after after the studies I got a very terrible job uh, at a very commercial law firm and um, in Holland and very soon I thought okay 
if I go on like this, it's, it looks like a very straight road and it will lead directly to my grave. You know, I know I can do it. I just have to, to your grave, get through. To your grave, passing purgatory. So in the, in the fires of purgatory, you are purged and then you can go into your grave. Uh, I'm not sure purgatory was even, <laughs> even you know, that's far too exciting a thing with all the fire and stuff. But no, I just thought, okay, I can do this, but it will just be like toil. I did not see any exciting things or challenges or inspirations. And, uh, and then I thought, okay, with tap dancing, it's not a straight road at all. I have no idea even what will come after the first bend in the road. And I'm sure something will exciting will happen. And who knows? Because tap dancing, it, it, it doesn't really exist. It's not a profession, really, in, in Holland. It's... Uh, it's an alien thing to do here. So that was so exciting that I thought, okay, I, I want to see what's behind the bend in the road. And uh, and if I don't do it now, I will I will never know. So I th stopped my job and uh, and said, from now, I will be a tap dancer. And I guess that's what happened. But how long did you train until you said, now I'm a tap dancer? Well, I, oh, it's a funny thing. Yeah, it's a really funny thing because after five days or five classes, so basically five hours you of thought, tap dancing. You thought you knew everything. <laughs> I know, I, I knew. <laughs> I definitely knew I don't know everything, but I knew I was a tap dancer, <laughs> which is something very strange. If I look back to it, it's like, well, how did that happen? I knew intuitively intuitively this is something that will lead me to interesting things i knew this is something that will show me stuff that through which i will learn stuff and uh, and that will give me tremendous joy while i'm doing all that but i also knew i can't tap dance yet so what was that in me that thought this is it and uh, i'm not sure I think it's a big mystery. But for the first time in my life, I had this this uh, this feeling or this insight. And uh, and I th even now, it's like 27 years later, that I was 21. And I'm still fascinated by this thing. And I still get tremendous joy out of the action of tap dancing, you know. <laughs> So I was right, even though I did not know anything. You know, my, I did not have any technique yet. After five hours, you you have nothing. Yeah, <laughs> and that's so true. So my name is Simon, Simon Bronikowski. I am an actor and a musician, and I live in Schwerte, uh, which is a very small town. In, it is near Dortmund and near Cologne. And... I work in a theater which is called Studio 7 Theater. We are a small group. We are three people, yeah. two actors and a director. And uh, what is also maybe special is that we run a bar as mm -hmm. a theater group. Uh, it's very special now in these times because I used to say we are working in two fields that will never, never, never die out. Because it it cannot be replaced <laughs> by it cannot be replaced by digital means cannot be automatized which is the bar mm -hmm. and the theater and now we <laughs> now it's uh, gone at least for the moment it is not That's there ironic the bar yeah. is closed and the theater is closed as you know <laughs> very very ironic so this is my situation I'm an actor mm -hmm. with a theater and a bar which are bo both closed um, we should a little bit talk about why we want to talk about theater and um, why a podcast 
So why are we making a perf uh, uh, not a performance? <laughs> why are we making a performance about theater? No. Why are we making a podcast about theater? I actually just discovered podcast very recently. It was on the outside, on the fringe of my awareness for a long time as something I might be interested to explore. But uh, now I, uh, I started listening to it because I do a lot of traveling in the car up and down to Denmark to uh, where I am an uh, artistic resident at, at uh, the NTL, the Nordisk Theater Laboratorium. And this is 10 hours in the car, basically, on my own. And the last hour or the last two hours I have taken to putting a podcast on my ears because you are transported through a conversation, usually, between uh, two or more people and you kind of float in the conversation and the time passes very, very gently as you are taken by the podcast. And it really made me fall in love with, with it in, as opposed to many of the radio that I was listening, where you are kind of getting nervous from the speed and all the interviews are kind of condensed and then there's advertisement and songs and music. And with a podcast, it was just a gentle floating. So I really love the stretch of time that a podcast gives to a conversation. That's it for me, a conversation. Yeah, that is also the name. <laughs> oh, surprise. True. <laughs> uh, True, yeah. So the, the name, I think the name is The White Room, Conversations on Theater. I was thinking about conversations on performance also in the beginning. But, um, is there a difference for you between performance and theater? I, sh I think we should make an episode on that. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> good point. No, no, no. I think there, it can be. It can be a difference. Uh, it can be a difference because, at least in... I mean, there's two differences. One is the difference in German performance. If you say performance in Germany, you mean Marina Abramovic things. Uh -huh. uh, this is... Uh, understood in Germany when you say performance, maybe not. Oh, okay. Maybe it's. I but think it's in English it's different, actually. Yes, that's why in English yeah. a performance is just. Uh, it's very general. It can be anything. General. Can be yes. music or juggling or your niece on the violin or the state theater. Yes, exactly. Or ballet. And that is what I like also about it. So it's it's a little bit more broad, broader. Yeah, but, it's very broad. Uh, so in my mind, I'm also thinking that we are having conversations on performance. because I actually agree. Yeah. Because I, I, I don't think we should change the name, but <laughs> in the first episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we should stick to it. But um, I, th I think this podcast will be also from our own interests it will be very open to 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 not only what is considered to be theater but also what is um, um, uh, more broadly considered to be performance or a performative act or performing mm -hmm. yeah everything that is connected around the topic of performance yeah so podcast, yeah, for me, I'm a, quite a passionate listener of podcasts. And I think, I believe that this is the best prerequisite to, to start one yourself. Because it's a, it's a kind of a strange, different world where a lot of things are possible. Very scripted, very, very produced, very nicely produced products, podcasts, uh, and also very um, loose conversations and also things in between. And um, it is not controlled by anybody. You can just start it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a, in the German podcast community, there is the hashtag go podcasting. And I think it's, it's true. Some, somehow I thought before that maybe people also should, should shut up more, no? You know, in this uh, culture of social media where everybody has an opinion and is shouting it out. Sometimes I feel that people should shut up more <laughs> but a podcast is actually different 
because you start you uh, or it can be different because you start you can start a conversation and you also have a conversation with the listener who is not here but he is listening and in his mind he's also maybe starting to talk with us no and uh, this this kind of strange performance which is the podcast is um, i find very fascinating i find it fascinating as a listener and uh, i find it now also fascinating as a producer <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and I never did it yeah. and um, so yeah, yeah it's, it's very interesting also that this uh, uh, medium puts puts the the dialogue or the conversation in the middle I feel that that is a, a very big generous offer of, of the podcast and when you listen to a podcast you really settle down for an hour with these people yeah And or, you give that time, yeah, or spend it, <laughs> or four hours, <laughs> or four hours. Have you have you ever had a podcast of four hours? Have you listened to that? Yes, yes, amazing. I listen. I Fantastic. have at least two podcasts that I listen to that are five, four or five hours. Wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> and it's uh, and there are some people, some uh, especially uh, news people or radio people, maybe media people that try to develop rules or methods mm -hmm. or categories yeah. for what is the best the podcast the yeah, formats yeah. what is what is a good podcast what are the, the the criteria for a good podcast which are which is absolutely a bullshit you have to say <laughs> because <laughs> yes. it yes. is it's um, it's just um, it's just not true You have, I think there was some kind of um, a surveys or research that was even being paid for that they made um, that the best podcast or the podcast that listen that people listen to mostly in average is like five minutes or something, and then this Aye. is this is why the best podcast is uh, the five minutes long. <laughs> oh, that's really terrible. Yes, it is. It is. I mean that's that's a nice parallel with theatre in a way, you know that that there is a lot of desire to structure and format theatre like this is good theatre and this is how you should make it and follow these uh, lines and then you will be successful. But uh, in the end, theatre is is this in the same way very ungraspable. There are people who break every rule known to <laughs> to theatre and they make wonderful things that. Or maybe some things that that only a handful of people enjoy, but they really enjoy it. So yes. <laughs> who can say what is the best theater? It's kind of a a moo question, you know moo. No. It's a, you mean the cow <laughs> moo? Not the cow moo. It's the Chinese <laughs> moo. It's this thing that that basically says, you know, you ask a question to someone and and they will answer moo, which means neither yes nor no. But the question is inappropriate. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> it's very smart. That's it's very smart. Very smart. That's great. Yeah, it's a good way of resisting move. the structuring things. And how like do you move. say you, you how do you how do you how's the melody if you say if I say to you maybe for instance Uh, what do you think? What is the best theater? Is it a theater with text or, <laughs> or is it the theater, the physical theater? What is the best? I don't know how I should say it. I, I have a, I have a picture in my mind of this of this Chinese person kind of shrugging their shoulders and kind of mumbling, <laughs> Moo. <laughs> like, Moo. I'm not interested in that question. Yeah. I'm, I've, I've never heard it uh, used in practice, actually. It's a story... Maybe it's not even true. I should look it up. But but I love the concept that you can say, "I'm not going with your question." Your you, the the way that you phrase this is out of the way that I want to think about things, so that I can answer it. Yes, it's great. Yeah, yeah, it is very nice. It's great. actually uh, this. Uh, you asked the question: Why about theater? Or why about performance? And uh, And why to talk about it? Because that's quite a strange thing. That's something that you should experience, or and either in the doing or in the witnessing as a spectator. So, what is the sense of speaking about that? 
Yes, it's 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 very strange because also in our in our work, let's say, or in our habit, in our not school, in our way of thinking, I mean, or my way of thinking, which is of course influenced by by um, other people. It's it's um, it's impossible to 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 speak about experience to speak about not to or maybe differently uh, mm. it's impossible to 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 talk about some things some things you maybe you cannot speak or you cannot say out you cannot speak about it you can experience it you can see isn't it isn't there a difference uh, simon in speaking about something and which i think you can always do by the way You can always speak about things, but what you can't do is capture the experience or transmit it so that you will know what I experienced. That's, I think, where the limit of, of speaking. Uh, but I can speak about like surrounding it with words. And there is a, even a, an interesting uh, translation that happens when you start to speak about something like theater. You're translating these visceral and and in many ways under the under the sea of consciousness experiences that you are having into something that that is essentially on a poetic level, right? It is pointing towards something. Even if you're trying to be very precise, you're pointing towards this uh ungraspable moment of happening or am I getting very philosophical here <laughs> yes <laughs> no <laughs> no it's 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 great I think there is something inside of that which we have to which we have to talk about <laughs> and yeah. um, I now have comes to my mind of course maybe my motto or our motto was has been what <clears throat> a famous uh, phrase of the Philosopher uh, Wittgenstein it uh, said, "Wovon man nicht sprechen kann, darüber mm -hmm. muss man schweigen." So, what is the the one translation that I find is, "Whereof one cannot speak, there mm -hmm. uh, thereof one must be silent." Exactly. And it's very. Exactly. It's a, I find it a very good, in a, a quite good uh, translation because when I think about this phrase. I think very much about the thereof one must be silent. It's not mm -hmm. that you it's not it's also in the German he says darüber muss man schweigen. It's like the the wrong the wrong uh, um, pronoun because in Germany you would say davon muss man schweigen. Mm -hmm. It means mm -hmm. you can't say anything about it. You have to be silent. Mm -hmm. But if you, you it's like You 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 keep silent about something. No? Ah, that's interesting. So it's actually very <laughs> it's, active. Yes, it is. A, so whereof one cannot so speak. It's a, so what is what is tells me is that it that he tries to create a very active ball of silence, let's say, around this thing that you cannot speak about, and it doesn't mean don't speak at all, but it means. This is my very personal translation. Eh? It means be aware that your words that you will use because you are human, you will speak about it, that they will only serve to approach this ball of silence that is the thing itself. Yes. Maybe it also it also means that you have to you have to be active about it. You have to for instance mm -hmm. in the theater you have to show. You have to show what you're doing. No? So this is what exactly. this is the, the the paradox and also of this this. Ah, oh, that's very beautiful, no? <laughs> It's very beautiful because in the, when you are using words in parallel to your actions in the theater, they are not the words that are trying to be the thing, but they are showing the thing, like an action shows the thing. So uh, this image of the ball <laughs> is very dear to me because it somehow it it really is like a image of 
both the power of the words and their and also how they cannot work. Yeah, the power of the words is also a very good phrase. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, yeah. Yeah, they are like holding hands around what you are trying to keep alive there in the middle. <laughs> yeah. And so this was the more or less let's say the motto the the, mm -hmm. the tacit motto that you cannot speak about it, it is very practical ah, also in the, in, nice. the, in the in yeah. the in the room also with it's very 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 banal that you cannot yeah. speak about the, the tap dancing you cannot speak no. about how to do it you have to do no. it it's it's very banal no to uh, every uh, it's uh, no but but you obvious. know Simon, this is it's, uh, wonderful this uh, this motto because it's actually i always understood it as an order not to speak but as you now and as we are now approaching it it's actually an invitation to speak but with a very specific use of words as actions because if you are now giving the example of teaching right you cannot uh tell someone how to tap dance. It's very true. You really can't. But what you can do with words is also essential. You can't teach someone tap dancing completely without words. Well, you can, <laughs> but it's extremely difficult. <laughs> yeah, it would be the Chinese way. Or the yeah, the Chinese You need a very, <laughs> very good student. Because what I do when I teach tap dancing with my words is I entice a student to in to be in a certain attitude of uh, perception so that they can perceive my action you know in a you know more clear clear way and then i also uh, present images metaphors which again entice the mind to make a certain translation into an action of their own like for instance for a certain action i will use the image of kicking an olive which tr conveys a lot of information that you should not kick it as if it's a large stone, which you would do very different. No, it's a little olive. So you would kick it with a bit of delicacy, right? So in that sense, my words in this, used in this way are not trying to explain uh, directly what is the action, but offer a metaphor, an image. So the invitation to speak in that way knowing that you're using metaphors, that you are enticing and, and uh, offering something that the listener will engage actively with it and start to act on their own with that image is extremely close, I think, to what theater can do. Yeah. And um, so I think that somehow, somehow it's, It's only logical to make a podcast to talk about theater. <laughs> it's yes. it's necessary. It's like it's, it's necessary. It's ne it's necessary, and um, If also we I yeah follow Wittgenstein. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Hello, Wittgenstein. He, maybe he's turning Lovely inside. Lovely to you. have you here with us. Yes, <laughs> Ludwig. Welcome. He is turning in his grave. And all the philosophers are shaking their heads now. And <laughs> Pulling please, their beards. <laughs> please, please don't touch your face in the times of crisis of corona. Please don't. <laughs> Just shake your heads. Yeah, we are. Yeah, maybe keep this your hands is, in your pockets. Maybe this is a, this is a kind of, a, how do you say, a, a feature of this podcast, of this project, mm -hmm. that, we, that we are also, in a kind of way, very curious, fanatic dilettantes of everything. We will talk ab about a lot of things, and um, mm -hmm. and we are we we are uh, not experts in the things. Yes, yes, I think that's very important to note that we that we are not experts, but but uh, in in everything that we will touch. But there's also the fact that we are speaking from from a an expertise in our own craft. And from this expertise, uh, you can approach a lot of areas that is, uh, that is not your home base, let's say, but you understand it from, uh, from another angle. So, Yes, and I think also what will be a kind of a feature of the podcast is uh, the right... <laughs> the right, and not only the tendency, but also the right to go astray and mm. to follow uh, your associations. 
as you would do in a real conversation. It is, we will uh, start, I think every episode, every, every gathering of us, we will have a kind of a topic. Today the topic is, what are we going to talk about in the podcast? <laughs> and what is more or less the idea <laughs> and uh, why? And so uh, and every episode, I think, will have a, will have a topic some kind of a topic um, but we have the right and the duty to go astray and to follow our our associations we have also of course we have to we have to get into this no into this kind of strange habit that you don't only i mean the ideal thing for me is to to just talk to each other but a little bit also to have in mind that that we are speaking together in front of other people no Uh, yes. or, or with other people actually we are speaking uh, we are having this conversation with us but with a third person yeah. and fourth and fifth and so um, um, Mariah what is, the, what is the plan of the podcast or let's talk about what we are going to do in the future right right so Um, you mean the future uh, the future episodes? Yes. You Ooh. can also tell me about your future, about tomorrow, about what are you going to... Well, actually... I, how are you going to survive the next <laughs> day? I would like to tell you... I would like to tell you about, uh, about my uh, motto ah, for this podcast. That's nice. Um, nice. Yeah. So I chose a, a motto that it comes from... Uh, the writer Rebecca Solnit, who is a, a Canadian writer, and she has amazing books. Many are called encyclopedias. She's like a non-fiction writer, but she does it in a very, very imaginative way. And I love her description of place. And the, uh, it, it comes from the introduction of her book Trouble and Spaciousness. No, the... It comes from the book The Encyclopedia of Trouble and Spaciousness. And in the introduction she writes, That thing we call a place is the intersection of many changing forces passing through, whirling around, mixing, dissolving, and exploding in a fixed location. To write about a place is to acknowledge that phenomena often treated separately, Ecology, democracy, culture, storytelling, urban design, individual life, histories, uh, sorry, individual life, histories, and collective endeavors coexist. They coexist geographically, spatially, in place, and, oh my god, this is quite a difficult text to read out loud. They coexist geographically, spatially, in place. And to understand a place is to engage with braided narratives and sui generis explorations. Phew. Hmm. Wow, did you understand anything of that, Simon? Not really. Not really, yeah. It's very difficult. <laughs> but it's, to read it's, it's, it's very, very uh, easy, but to, write, to read it aloud so that you would understand it, actually it's, it's complicated. But yeah, I can paraphrase a, the meaning. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. So, it means that anything you describe, a locus, uh, a, a place, is an interweaving of different levels of, of perspectives and narratives that are going through histories, geographies. Um, scientific knowledge about it, techniques, and that uh, to kind of describe all that or to catch something all that, we have to follow the threads of narrative that go through. And um, sui generis is like very uh, unique in its own kind, individual. So I understand it as the biographies of things. So what is very specific to this one thing? You're not talking about theater in general. You're speaking about this theater. You're speaking about this performance. 
this actor. Yes, you're speaking. Um, you're speaking from something, no? Yeah, and then the whole complex of all that, and then the the reason why it it points to a place why I thought that was appropriate is because you could say that we, as humans that are doing theater, are a place where theater exists. We are a locus where all these threads come together and weave, and then we are the place that at that moment for us theater is uh, is built, is existing. So we are places. Hmm. And uh, you said that it was the motto for, for you for, for now or for the podcast. Yes. Yeah, because I think our podcast will be in the same way that she describes, very layered um, and many perspectives and then also weaving our own narratives with those that we uh, have met, people that we have met or that we read or that we have witnessed or maybe seen in the theater. Not only people, but also objects and, and, and plays and uh, music and all these things will be woven together to create another locus, which hopefully will be uh, interesting. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and uh, kind of, uh, uh, it's not a ersatz, it's not a replacement, but a kind of no, uh, extra, not at all. extra home. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's its own locus, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, extra home. Very nice. Yeah, I will tell you my motto. Nice. It's, um, yeah, it's very easy. It comes from uh, Duke Ellington. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, it goes like this. <laughs> it's a poem. Yeah. It's a poem. Duke, he wrote, uh, I think he wrote it, I have to look it up, between two concerts or something. In some, yeah. In some moment. And it goes like this. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. It mm -hmm. makes no difference if it's sweet or hot. Just give that rhythm everything you've got. And there's more. Lovely. S and um, maybe if there is for me any criteria for, 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 for quality, maybe, it's a certain something which you cannot talk about which you cannot mm. uh, you cannot Ludwig again yes and you cannot Ludwig the jazz mu musician <laughs> 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 uh, which you cannot uh, write down in yeah. notation with in, in yeah. the music sense you can just put it above the score yeah. as a kind of hopeful yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> please adjective. please please swing <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I think we should also, in one, because I, 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 one mm -hmm. of the reasons that I wanted to talk also with you is, is that uh, also the musical reason, because I think in one moment we should take time to speak about rhythm. And, Definitely. Um, to speak about, but this, what I mean now, swing, in this sentence, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. It's the, maybe a criteria, not only for the music, but... It's something similar that the flamenco singers and dancers uh, call duende, no? Elf or goblin, spirit. And what, what means just a, a little kind of something which is, which is part of a, a gift of a performance, no? It is a, it is a gift of the moment. You cannot, um, you cannot, um, you cannot force it. Mm -hmm. You cannot force it. You have to let it happen. And so this yeah. is the swing or the the duende, the, mm -hmm. the, the little magic spirits that that help us to create um, um, great performance and great music. And this is something which for me is a defines quality. And uh, what I look for, what I most of the time uh, I cannot attain, maybe. But sometimes it happens, and it happens when you're when some a lot of work mm. is done, and but then you have to somehow let it happen. But this is another question. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a good topic. Let's let's put it there. I I absolutely agree. I mean, mm. I was just sort of <laughs> visualizing the score with this swing above it, and then the score is actually written in straight eights. If that says you anything, yes. And because of this 
uh, word swing above, you know that you should play it not straight, but different with swing. Yeah. So it's a, it's a lovely, uh, I love that you brought that into your motto because it's absolutely the difference between what is graspable and technical and you can write it down and be very precise. And then this thing that is asked for the performers, make it swing, which uh, you cannot anymore confuse the score with the performance <laughs> when that word is there. It absolutely <laughs> tells you very clearly you have to do something with these notes, with this technique, and then it will be uh, present, what is asked. Yeah, and then, of course, this brings me to what I was thinking about. I, I, I would really like to compare the score, the musical score, mm -hmm. to the performance, because in my mind, in my understanding, what we create when we work on a theater play, the score is not the text Let's say if we have a text, Shakespeare, Hamlet, mm -hmm. no? We have the text of Shakespeare, but this is not the score. No. This is not the score. It's maybe before. It does not exist in music, maybe. Uh, what is the score for music, for, for the musician, is for me as an actor, is what I create together with my colleagues in the space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it is uh, the, the score in the space, the Partitura, no? Together, yeah. all the, all the, or maybe all, only my score, and then this score is written, is is rehearsed, is is developed in a certain way, mm -hmm. and afterwards you perform it, and yeah. uh, it is it becomes something different. Uh, the play is not the play that is written. The play is is what we are did in the in the space and what is written inside of the space. Mm -hmm. and what is uh, written into our body memory and mm -hmm. we can and we access like a, like a score and uh, only then we start performing and only then begins also another kind of work which is uh, a really great work which is the work on dynamic on rhythm and on the small 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 details and also the small improvisations no mm -hmm. that you have you have the fixed score but it's always will be a different kind of performance not mm -hmm. because of you that you improvise if you're not yeah. doing impro theater which is also a kind of way of performing improvised performing but if you it even if you have a fixed score De definitely a performance that you that you that you repeat then You have spaces. You have sm you have details of improvisation in it, and this. I guess it's not even details uh, of even if you would not uh, uh, do that. It's just the act of manifesting again uh, the piece, right? Which is not the score. The score is your memory. Uh, it's just all the things you do to kind of remind yourself that this piece exists like that. But when you do it, the piece is born again in a very real way. It's born in a new way. And uh, for me, always the example of classical music is so so powerful because there is a, it's very obvious how you know how detailed the score is written and uh, and then it's put together and it's played. And the musicians are very conscious, conscientious even of how to be true to the score, to the most small detail, and how to be true to what the composer meant. But still, even with all that, when a classical musician plays a piece, it is born again, exactly in the same way as when you're improvising, which is something took me so long to, to realize that this is, that the difference is, is not so great between an improvising musician and a musician is playing a score. Yes, that's... Uh... They are both birthing the music at this very moment. Yes, 
So I think also that this 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 project, this podcast, is also from I speak from from a from a certain point, from a certain place, no, from a certain. I, I speak from as not I'm not speaking abstractly about. I'm speaking from a place, and I think that the podcast is is speaking from uh, also from the performers place at least for me uh, it is um, i don't say actor in this moment but i think that we will be very interested in this podcast to speak about what is what is performing acting dancing singing even painting maybe i don't know uh, what is what happens and what happens in your practice no so this is a podcast this will be a podcast about about theater but from a performance perspective I'm not I don't think it will be a podcast about theater let's say which theater plays in the or which are the best theater plays in the mom moment or no which is the current uh, stream of uh, dramaturgy or the current political discussion around theater maybe it comes uh, maybe there comes some things into it but um I think it yeah. will be um, a podcast also about and from the perspective of practices and practitioners. Yeah, our practice and, and practitioners and, and, and those of our guests. Yes, we will have guests. Yeah, and I think it's very nice uh, how you say, Simon, that, that you know, we speak from our practice, from our position very specifically as performers, as theater makers, as uh, people who have fun <laughs> doing all this, which is a perspective that, that I really love to share, actually. Because many times the text about theater, they are coming from maybe a, a director or maybe a critic or maybe a theater researcher. And I think it's a good thing to speak out as a performer, to uh, share what we know, how we experience, and and how we dialogue also with each other, and how can a tap dancer speak with an actor, and where, what then lies in between? What are we both uh, exchanging in that sense? Yes. And so, yeah. So you said we will have guests. Um, yes. we, are, we are planning to have uh, we are planning to have guests to speak with people. First, of course, people that we know, uh, friends, even uh, colleagues. Definitely, we will engage in, in in conversations with them. It will not be interviews in the classical sense. It will. I think it will be. Um, conversations without um, and the limit is of course the time of the guests and of our and our, of us but um, we will take our time oh we will have many guests uh, i think in this podcast and it, i think it's very nice that that we can ask as we are speaking from our own positions as performers and uh, and humans who have fun and who have lives We will also speak with our guests in that way. So uh, it's actually come to another topic, Simon, that, that I think we should, we should uh, talk about at some point, which is in how far when you, when you are working in theater and, and you could say in a way that life is our material, in how far can you say that your profession is separate from your private life your professional life uh, is fed by your by your private life in such a direct way like your imagination is one of your main tools your physical body is one of your main tools so in i think in this realm of theater and performance um, to keep the private life meticulously out in this uh, uh, in this conversations that we are having, it would not make so much sense. I'm, I'm very interested in where does this these two spheres uh, touch each other, and then how do they feed each other? Yes, definitely. Don't worry, we will not talk talk about work life balance. Never work life balance. <laughs> What is all that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so also I think we, we can give a very nice insight in a way of how this crazy life 
works out as a performer. Yeah. In, in the sense, it is a, it is a bit uh, pulling the curtain open from a from a secret, uh, uh, secret place <laughs> behind the stage, in the dressing room, and then in the car home, and then on the couch home. No, <laughs> not too far. No, we go that far. But, <laughs> and then under the shower. And, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is. I mean, it is also an interesting thing about about theatre that everything can be there, but when it's sexual, it gets put into this very specific place called pornography, right? I mean, there's another topic that would be interesting to explore. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is, but in a kind of uh, other way. Ludwig Wittgensteinian what would, way. <laughs> what would Ludwig say? Exactly. <laughs> or what would he not say? <laughs> a you know, deafening silence. But what one thing is maybe that uh, one thing that we can have in mind for this discussion is that on the theater stage, you present. No, you you don't present. You represent. And you, as a performer, and everything which is on the stage becomes a, a sign, no? a sign for yeah, something else. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, this is a very practical reason. It's not like it's, it's a taboo or something. It's happening a lot. But what happens if you, uh, if you are uh, nude on stage? I mean, really, uh, also the intimate parts. I think it happens... Uh, uh, that's why a lot of times... As I saw in performances, it does not really work um, because what happens is that it's 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 too real, especially the intimate parts. They are too uh, um, real, and they they break out of this convention of being a sign for something else. Mm -hmm. And this is also exactly. why you should not have animals on stage and or or, or little children. Uh, I mean babies. Or technicians. Uh, or, te <laughs> <laughs> or any private person, exactly. You, this is the, this is the, the it, it breaks, yeah. it, it breaks yeah. this, and you can break it, of course, you can do it, but I think you, yeah, sh you should... Yeah, it's tricky, yeah. You it's, it's very it's tricky. tricky and, um, yeah, yeah, it's very but tricky. But this is a very but interesting this, topic. It, it really is, I mean, this... this I love the image of the of of the actor as always doing signs. I mean, in, it, it's obvious, though, in this space of the stage where where nothing happens. Actually, it's an empty state. It's an empty place. So everything that that you put in there has cannot be itself. It has to be something else. Otherwise, it would not be there because the stage is essentially empty. Nothing happens in that. Like it happens in my kitchen, I mean, a lot of things happen. You know, the the flowers are busy dying that are in the <laughs> in the vase. Uh, there is food that's uh, blah blah blah. Everything is so uh, busy doing their thing. I'm talking with you, but in the stage, nothing happens. Essentially, you have to put it there, and then it can be anything except itself. Yeah. Anyways. It have to be a sign in other ways, and and this is exactly I think uh, what we were speaking about earlier uh, when we were talking about Wittgenstein. This this uh, thing in the middle that you cannot speak about. So you have to everything that you use becomes a sign that hopefully pointing to that thing, but it's not the thing itself. See, yeah. it cannot be itself. Just like on the stage, so. It's interesting to you point out some things that can absolutely not be signs in that sense, or very it's very complicated to use as signs. Uh, and like it's very uh, good. They do not fit in this ball of uh, of um, can I call it the ball of Wittgenstein, or is that very strange? <laughs> if you do, if you don't put an S behind the ball. Then it maybe it can be okay. I will I will use it as a private image anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But I have been actually at one point performing nude, and uh, and it did do something very important for me as a as a performer. I believe it was uh, in a very special circumstance. It was at the Burning Man Festival in uh, in Nevada, 
USA. Mm -hmm. And firstly, you know, half the people are nude over there. It's it's like it's a normal Pre thing. Prerequisite. Pre yeah, I mean, so that already <laughs> takes away a little bit of this, uh, uh, like, in it's it's absolute realness because <laughs> it, it became uh, not so much of a big deal. And um, but, however, to stand there nude and tap dancing, it was firstly a little uncomfortable. I have to say, like, you don't have your bra, and it's like, oh, everything is flying around and but the thing that it taught me was okay so anything you uh wear on the stage it's actually not there to cover up any you know offensive parts of your body like nipples or pubic hair or your ass or something it's because you can perfectly well you're you're perfectly functioning on the stage with all that exposed so that cannot be the reason for wearing anything or or the other way around. What you're wearing is not necessary for you to be able to perform, if you know what I mean. It's perfectly possible to perform naked, actually, if you do it well. Mm, yeah. And if the if the context is right. So it gave yeah. me a lot of confidence knowing that, okay, whatever is, you know, clothed or unclothed or showing or not showing, it does not really matter in that particular space. I don't have to be modest. I don't have to be uh, covered up. Or yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was very liberating. And I actually thought, okay, so this, I think every performer should do it once just to yes. have that experience of my body mm. is enough. It's there. <laughs> it's fine. Okay, this is an interesting fact. I think, yeah, I just want to add to that, that it's an interesting fact that you're talking about, about yourself, but you're not mm -hmm. talking about the spectator. So and the question is, is there a reason other than you in mm -hmm. your... Training, in basically. Your, in your, let's say, if, if, if you can put it hard, is there a reason other than your personal growth or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. Is 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 there any reason to 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 do it for the performance as a performance? And this is maybe uh, different also. I don't know. Different. I mean, for the reason <laughs> performative wise for us, and that's maybe also not thinking of the spectator, but more of us, is that we did not have any money for costumes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the easiest way to make a big group of people look kind of unified and and a little bit like they could represent maybe uh, monkeys or apes or very early humans was to be naked and put some mud on us. Uh, <laughs> it was actually very effective, I have to say. And yeah, maybe it did make a big difference that the spectators were absolutely not phased at all by nudity in that community, right? Because half of the audience was naked. So... <laughs> Yeah, that that might have played a part. <laughs> there is actually a, a, a there is actually a podcast, a German theatre podcast, which mm -hmm. I I have to start to listen now. Also, uh, curiosity, and uh, two journalists are talking about uh, the theatre scene uh, in in Germany. Um, There's like half hour, half an hour podcast, and there is one episode where they, where they talk about this. Can you Nudity. be can you be nude on stage or not? Yeah. <laughs> so I have to listen. I will listen to it and I will tell you okay, good. And report what, they, back. what they say. Yeah. And I think actually uh, the stage makes a very big difference. Where is the stage? I think in a proscenium theatre it's way more difficult than it is in the desert in in uh hmm in uh, Nevada. Yeah, which does not prevent them from using it a lot of times. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, uh, Simon, uh, do you have any like concluding remarks for this first episode? Yeah, Mariah, this was our first episode our first talk i'm very happy 
um, that we talked and I'm looking forward very much to how this experiment unfolds. I want to conclude this episode with a small audio that uh, we found on, on, on Facebook. It was going around on Facebook. It is an address by uh, Eugenio Barba, the artistic director of Odin Theatre, uh, regarding the current situation uh, of uh, almost quarantine in the crisis of uh, Corona. And as we spoke today about uh, this podcast, also as a reaction to the limitations that are posed upon us, um, I leave it here for, for you, for you, Mariah, for, for me and for the listeners, uh, these words, which I find very interesting and somewhat comforting. Wonderful. So, Mariah, we will speak again very soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Ciao. Fear depends on an attraction and on a decision. The decision is in the hands of an individual who decides to leave the daily dimension in which he lives, his home, and uh, move across the town and go to a place where the attraction is, is, exists, is, is there. And the attraction is also other human beings, other individuals who perform, tell, present the story. They do it for uh, entertaining, for giving an aesthetic uh, experience, make people reflect, to present, face them with a sort of excess. It doesn't matter, but this is theater, this moment where the decision of an individual needs the skill of other individuals, the actors, able to create this fictive world, this fiction, which is the performance. A reality which sometimes is even more real than the real life. When we cannot move from our homes, when we cannot cross the town and go to the place of attraction, which we call theater, then we are just reduced to the historical periods when the plague closed, shut the theaters. We know this from uh, the time of Shakespeare. When this happened, Shakespeare was not performing, not writing plays. He was writing sonnets and earning his life by dedicating these poems to a, a, a noble person. We remain in our home. We use technological thing. This period of coronavirus will be remembered as a period where the whole society, the whole planet, suddenly was no longer be able of enjoying of this freedom, of the decision of the spectator to go to the place of attraction where the actors were performing. If it lasts a very long time, maybe the consequences can be that we forget that theater is possible in our society. Or opposite, we will discover how strong is the need for this strange meeting and uh, we will be able to experience a renaissance. So, if we survive, we will see.